In recent years, femicide cases across the globe have increased drastically. With countries like Russia decriminalising forms of domestic abuse and Canada having systemic issues against Indigenous women, femicide has only become more prominent. I wanted to find out more about the issues women across the globe face daily. I guess, how did it feel to be a woman in 2020? Kind of weird, to be honest, because, like, there are still so many, like, protests going on for, like, women's rights, reproductive rights especially, and I don't know, I kind of thought that by now all of this would be, like, yeah, you, it's your body, you can do what you want with it. It feels, I'm sure, better than it would in the 1600s. <laughs> um, yeah. But you still read a lot and experience a lot that just makes you feel like shit. I mean, there's the, like, kill all men thing. <laughs> and people who hate men. Yeah. I don't agree with that, because it's about equality and not women over men. <laughs> Femicide is an issue globally, and over the past decade, more and more cases have come to light. Across the world, women are getting killed simply for existing, and that has to change. One country riddled with racially charged femicide is Canada, and Northern British Columbia is notorious for it. However, I wanted to begin a few borders south of there in Honduras. When it comes to Honduras, it's the perfect place to start looking at the killing of women because it's disproportionate, the law overlooks it, and it's a daily struggle to survive. And just looking at the facts and statistics, it's crazy to me because so few cases get convicted. And compared to the UK, you would think that there was nothing happening out there. I spoke to law and criminology student Safwan Cartwright to get her perspective on this. I think that anyone would, who has committed femicide would be charged higher than someone who's killed. Do you think yeah. that depends what country you live in? Yeah, if we're talking about the UK, they would definitely be given higher, just because of the whole, there's a massive movement at the minute for um, like the protection of women against these type of things. One of Honduras' most famous victims of femicide was 19-year-old Maria Jose Alvarado, the title holder of Miss Honduras World 2014. Just hours before she was due to fly out to London for the 2014 Miss World competition, she was shot twice in the back by her sister's boyfriend. Her 23-year-old sister was also killed and their bodies dumped in a field. Had this happened a year earlier, it would not have been classed as a serious felony in the eyes of the law. So I managed to get in touch with the Honduras Armed Police Force who managed the killings out there and I sent them an email to see if they wanted to do a Zoom interview to get their side of the story and with pretty much every press interview and the same with us they declined the offer to comment so... Maria Jose and her sister were victims of a violent femicide in Honduras but they're far from being the only ones Domestic abuse runs rife across the country and is almost deemed normal in most communities there. The domestic violence being normalised is more often than not what leads to these killings. Something that I've noticed is that, as Saffron said, first world countries are pushing femicide cases into court like never before. But then you've got countries like Honduras that have only recently criminalised 
domestic abuse. And I think domestic abuse falls hand in hand with why there's so many femicide cases in places like Honduras and that has to change. Another place that struggles with femicide is Canada. Only there, it's a whole different ball game. Canada has a dark secret. The killing of hundreds of indigenous women on the remote highways. I wanted to find out more about why this has slipped under the radar and why so many women are being killed each year. Can you imagine as a young girl you're hitchhiking to the next town and you get off the lift by a guy and you think he's safe so you get in the car and then the next thing you know you're being driven off into a remote walking trail where you're probably about to get raped and dismembered and then left for dead. Um, yeah. I think that would be pretty scary. It's like quite a lot of this stuff, I know it sounds a bit stupid, but a lot of stuff I've learned recently has been from people on TikTok. And it's like, it's not just like a social media platform, it is a pretty good place for getting information. The Highway of Tears is a term that started in 1998 at a vigil for four missing women in Terrace, BC. The highway stretches 725 kilometers and there are 23 reservations along this highway. The actual name of the Highway of Tears is Highway 16 and due to poverty rates and lack of transportation a lot of women would hitchhike on this highway which is where this sign came from. Girls don't hitchhike on the Highway of Tears because so many women have gone missing or were found murdered on this highway. They literally had to make a sign for it. I knew that there was like a disproportionate amount of indigenous women being murdered like across America. I didn't realize there was like a, like a zone where it happened. We hear a lot about femicide from places like South America mm. and Mexico. But we don't think it's happening in Canada or down the road. Because we've got this like list of countries in our heads of like the US and Canada, Canada's one of them because people always think Canada, because Canada's right next to the US and the US is such a shit show that everyone's like, Canada's amazing. Yeah. It's not, it's fine. It's better than some places, but it, just because you're better than some places doesn't mean you're doing great. Exactly. Same with the UK, same with pl even places like France. We've got this little list in our head. We're like, these are the good countries. They respect people. And these are the bad countries where people die. And that's just not true. It's I got in touch with Sergeant Wayne Clary, who ran the EPAN investigation into the Highway of Tears. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the police standpoint is on one of Canada's biggest issues when it comes to Indigenous women and killing. Yeah, Project EPANA it was, um, it was actually developed by, in Canada, RCMP is the Royal Canadian Mounted Police is the, uh, sorry for the history lesson here, but some, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, but it's kind of the natural, the national police force, and we have contracts with provinces and municipalities. 
Well, they contract the provincial policing in British Columbia, which and so we do everything. Um, so anyways, um, in 2006, uh, in, in the RCMP in British Columbia, there's a major crime section. Essentially, it's a province-wide unit that, that helps out um, RCMP units within the province on big homicide files or any homicide files when they, you know, they need the expertise or the manpower, especially the smaller communities, you know, in isolated, you know, areas of the province. Um, so it's quite a big unit. Um, I think right now it's, you know, with, with all the support today, it's like over 250 people, which is, you know, BC is, I don't know what, uh, 6 million people-ish. But anyway, so um, we are aware of, you know, what was going along up in, in the north and, and, and women going missing and murdered and, and unsolved. So they developed um, uh, a team in 2006 to see if there was a, a, you know, a one killer or a serial killer, just to have a really good look at it. Killings of women in Canada don't just take place on the highway. The red light districts in Edmonton and other cities suffer with the killing of trans women and indigenous women on a huge scale. Why do you think this is such a notorious area for these killings then? I mean, I know it's very remote, but is there other reasons that this is happening out there? Well, unfortunately, um, killings go on all the time. Um, and uh, you, you kind of hit it a little bit. It's very remote. Um, Project Dupana focused on, um, you know, the lifestyles of these gals. Uh, we'll say high risk, and I would include hitchhiking on a lonely road, essentially in the middle of nowhere, as high risk. Um, so there's that, and, in, and of course, the North and our First Nations community, there's some economic disparity, disparities. There's, you know, there's substance abuse, like everywhere in this province, in this world, which contributes to that type of thing. And of course, there's a historical element where I'm sure you've researched, you know, what our then Canadian government did with First Nations communities decades ago. And we're still living that, the results of that today. And that's, that's a big part of it as well. I know that you worked closely with the families of the 18 women that were part of the e-panic cases, but a lot of people have said that they feel let down by the police a bit, not necessarily uh, the EPANA task force, but the police in general. Um, and I know that I was looking into the case of Amber Tukuro, um, who it took a long time before the police got in touch with places for CCTV footage, um, by which time it had been taped over and stuff. Why is it then that some cases take so long to sort of be investigated? Well, y you know, from my experience, um... Like I would say the solve right in the, in the First Nations communities are the same as the other communities. I think they're, they're hovering around 90%. Like, so there's that. Um, I think a lot of the times that uh, these cases aren't solved just because of what I spoke early, earlier of that, you know, that it's, it's a crime of opportunity. They're one-offs. Um, most of the times the victims aren't known or vice versa. Um, and they're very, very tough, especially historical. Um, uh, the video footage is not available. Um, um, many times we were lucky enough to have DNA because the exhibits or the crime scene examination was handled properly. Um, 
Today, everybody has cell phones. There's video everywhere. We can track their movements. We can kind of see where they're going. Um, not so much in the countryside because of, like the cell phone towers are further apart, so you have a wider range. But in the cities, we can we can tell within within a couple of blocks of where a person has been. Um, so this, technically, there's a lot more available today than there was in these old old files. You know, one of the things that we can deal with immediately is, 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 is the girls hitchhiking or people hitchhiking. So they put bus service in there, but it's, you actually have to drive, you know, between Prince George, which is in the interior of British Columbia and Prince Rupert, which is on the coast. It's, um, and then there's small little towns in between, but it's, a, it's, it's an eight hour drive, um, several hundred kilometers, and it's very, very lonely in spots. And, um, and you know, when, you, when it comes to young people, hitchhiking we can't unfortunately we can't kind of take over their brains and tell them not to do it i really wanted to come back to one of the places that this all started for me and that was with the logging trails in the remote woodlands and although we can't be in canada you still can feel how eerie it is being out here in a remote logging trail in England in the fog. And I think one thing that strikes me is the fear that these girls must have when they're brought out to places like this. There's no one, there's no one around for miles. And that must be terrifying because who's gonna hear you if you scream for help or shout? And I think I've noticed throughout all of this, throughout all the research and the interviews, one thing is that the forces do not do enough to enforce the fact that women are going missing and being murdered in locations like this. And especially in Canada, there's no remote bus services or anything so girls get snatched walking to school all the time and that's really scary to me and that's something that has to it has to change and the police have to change for that to get better <laughs>